Don, I think somebody's trying to sell you some Medicare <laughs> supplemental insurance. That is the 92nd call today, and it's only... <laughs> Last August, I went over to my friend Don Cameras to work on a movie about Edward Moybridge. I also got to see some of Don's own photographs that had been inspired by Moybridge. So far, Don and I have made nine movies in our ongoing series about the history of photography. I'll be honest, Don's the teacher and I'm the student. That's why I think it's so important to show you some of Don's own work and hear him talking about it. Because Don's passion for and knowledge of photographic history comes not just from looking at it, but doing it. Moybridge, for me personally, was the first photographer that on a very guttural level jumped out. The whole notion of stopping time, that sequence, that felt right to me. It was about analyzing the physicality of life, whether it's people moving or animals moving. I considered myself a very physical person. I prided myself on you know, whatever athleticism I had. So well, moving was very important to me. And these were the analysis of movement. So I knew there was something really interesting to me about this. And where it first manifested itself was not stopping action, but to the contrary, the photographic blur, the uh, slow exposure, moving of the camera. I really got fascinated with that. Here's the two pictures that I took real early on that got me into it. I'm walking down Pine Street. I see a doorway in an old stucco building. I set the camera for a quarter of a second shutter speed, and I swirled it, as you can see, in a circular motion. You don't know what you're going to get until you develop the film. Sometimes I look at people doing digital photography, and I think, oh, I would love to see the picture right away. But then that would take away the whole magic of seeing it later. And in this case, that's what this was all about. So here's this doorway at a quarter of a second swirl. I then set the camera to a one full second, four times as long, and swirled much slower. This is the product. This very human piece of anatomy, whether it's a, a woman's knee or someone laying on their belly with their leg up. It's so human. I thought, how the hell can wood and stucco with only three quarters of a second difference in the photographic process produce an image so different. I thought, man, I'm onto something here. And I had to do a little public relations job. There was a dinner party at the art museum and I had to photograph it. People in long black dresses and guys in tuxedos. I seem to remember being up on the balcony area looking down with a telephoto lens. I set it at a half a second, pointed it toward an area that I thought had a good strong structure and this is the picture. You look at these cubes for heads. Where did they come from? How did that happen? If I have a guardian angel, maybe this never really did happen. The guardian angel made this picture happen. And two years later, when I was doing my senior project, this particular book became the product. My teacher was a documentarian. His name was Lake Scoopforce. did a fantastic documentary book, I'll do a plug for him, called The Most Natural Thing in the World about the conflict in Northern Ireland. Went there for years, photographed both sides, powerful, powerful, powerful pictures. I mean, he didn't care about this kind of stuff. I had a blurry picture, blurry picture, blurry picture, and he's like, yeah, 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 so what? And then he saw another picture that wasn't, and he said, gee, well, why don't you put them together? And I thought, what the hell is he talking about? They got nothing to do with one another. But then it, I thought about it, and it, what clicked was, hmm, maybe what he was telling me, to take the same picture more than once from the same scene. And what's cubism? The same thing from many different angles. So I thought, right, he's right. So I would photograph the same scene, a weeping willow tree. I'd shoot it still, and then I would blur the camera to the right, take another exposure, blur the camera to the left, and go in the dark room and create what are called multiple prints. So this particular image is maybe three different negatives combined in the dark room with a little burning and dodging. And it was a very fussy process, and I'm not a technical person. So I had mostly failures, failures, failures. But I continued for several months, and this became the product. My one blurry mountain picture with the still clouds. This was a one of a kind. It was like dancing with the camera because I would take a half second exposure of this part of it and I would stay in one position for a quarter of a second 
and then during the exposure I would jump to another position for the latter part of the exposure, trying to get two dominant images with the blur in the middle. I only had one successful image, and that was it, of the church. And then I took another picture of it still, and then I just combined them right there at that horizontal roof line. One of my college friends from Connecticut looked at it, a real intellectual kid, and said, oh, I see two forms of religion, one moving forward and one being stagnant. This is one where I did a multiple exposure of this building from many, many segments. I'm not even sure how I did it. And then obviously the simple cut and paste with a certain material called ruby with. This one I showed my evidence. Here, one exposure is the blur. And then you can see I didn't make a good connection. This is what most of my prints look like. I made a mistake. So I decided to keep the mistake just to show the process of how it was done. This one I just vibrated the background, leaving the foreground sharp and still. Very brief interruption. Check out my movie about Richard Kagan. There is a visual similarity between Richard's blurred sacred Japanese shrines created over the past decade and Don's experimental images made back in 1975. But the aims of the two photographers are quite different. Don told me that in those days he was drawn to movement speed, acceleration. Richard's photos are about spiritual contemplation and stillness, seen from the point of view of a man in his 70s. Okay, now back to you, Don. Now here's where I started to just play around with designing pages, trying to keep that gesture and attitude going in one direction. My favorite of that ilk, was this one. Classic South Philly shot. If you come in close, you'll see it's just four old guys sitting in the middle of a basketball court on a park bench. But at a quarter of a second, they become secretariat, busting out of the gate in the Triple Crown. I love the fact that these are the same four guys, and they look so like traveling at 100 miles an hour. And so Moorbridge kind of set the tone for all this stuff. And then I started doing multiple exposures three exposures, four exposures on the same negative. Again, the key, I didn't know what I was going to get. And then it started to get cubist, like here. The same guy, three views of him sitting on the park bench, having his lunch at the University of Pennsylvania, and then there's the park bench after he left. Now, my teacher was a documentarian. He looked at this at the end of the semester and said, uh, yeah, all right, good job, Donald. Looks like you had something going there and you had nothing to say. I showed it to my mother, my 70-year-old mother at the time, and she got very nervous when she got to this one. This is the University of Pennsylvania, fancy architecture, three or four exposures overlapping, and she said, you know, Donald, we're not sending you to college to make pictures of hallucinations. <laughs> she said it in 1975, and I thought, that's the smartest comment ever made. <laughs> this lady is so smart. If she had actually ever gone to college, and decided to enter the outside world, she would be like competing with Lee Iacocca. Because <laughs> she just was the most intelligent and down to earth, but never left Hemingway Place kind of lady. Yeah, did you feel like, ah, I should stop doing this kind of photography? Or Oh no, I just thought, wow, she's as smart as I am. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I never had thought that before. <laughs> so here, this one was one of a kind, where I took a picture of a scene, and then I photographed the same scene with the blurs, and I just included these two little segments. I was trying to build a picture like a collage artist, and I was trying to capture the same energy that the Moy Bridges did, and of course, Murray certainly did. This is a statue that's on 7th and Pine. It's still there, but to this day, it's been broken so many times, it only has legs. It's completely gone. So here's how it went. Exposure, exposure, I got lucky that they were so aligned. And the third exposure, I blurred it. So it was kind of like up, up, and away. And this was a one of a kind or two. Probably the closest thing to a cubist picture, like truly abstract. What's the best thing that double exposes on itself? Darkness. So the way the shadows overlapped on one another was both a perfect way to experience uh, the double exposure, because it's black on black on black, 
and you get to create you know the most abstract unrealistic of shapes and forms that one in particular reminds me a little bit of ray metzger it certainly does and i had at this point i knew who he was and he was not my teacher sophomore year he was the teacher to the other class i got the documentarian guy and i guess i was trying to be a little ray at this point for sure hmm. yeah so anyway this is what moy bridge gave to me in terms of the kind of inspiration his pictures connected in me, this book was a product of that. The final uh, chapter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, chapter's not good either. Okay, well. The, all right, I got it. Okay. So, in terms of this idea that culminated in the book, after that, the pictures were around. For the next six months, they were still on my mind. And I had this original picture that was in the book. It was a perfect situation for multiple exposures. A building was boarded up with plywood that was painted white. So, it was perfect contrast, black on white. So we can see one, two, three, or four exposures. I kind of knew what I was going to get this time because I had already been doing them for a while and I knew I was building some sort of boxy construction. And I used to use a lot of razor blades and I used to cut a lot of masks in those days. And I used to like the random cuts that were on my mask. So I would play with that. And I put the copy of the print and I just started randomly slicing it to pieces after it had been dry mounted. I would establish a gesture, oh, here's a diagonal area, and I would go like this. And I would just start slicing away diagonally, You're not looking. And where the four corners would meet, at some point, a piece of photo would lift off. And then I selectively decided which ones to take away. So all these white shapes are a product of random cutting and then selection later as to which ones fit the composition best. This offended every photography person I ever showed it to. They were like, how could you cut your pictures up? Take a picture of it, you know? And I'm like, eh, that's not what it's about. But then I did take it to the final step. With the same idea of putting down masks and having random slices all over them from the energy, this came out of it. Now what this is, is three separate photographs in the kitchen where I used to live, looking down on a pile of dishes and a countertop, looking straight at it, and then looking at it again from this angle. And here's the floor. In every case, the floor will come up. And then I would put this negative in the enlarger, looking in that direction, lay a particular mask on it, and create one section of the picture. Then I would change the negatives to the straight on one, put that in there with a different mask on top of it, and then print that part of the picture. And then the third part from that angle with an even different mask, to print that book. So in a way, this was as close as I came to being der literally derivative of cubism. But I'm not doing anything new. I know that. It's the process that's going to be new. And that was part of the magic. It's the process that creates the blur. I don't create the blur. It's the silver and the light and the exposure and the chemicals. That's what makes that blur. I'm like the contractor that sends the workers to work. And then they do the work. And then I come home with the product after I pay them off. You know? So in a way, this is almost the product of photography. And I, I hardly did anything except push the process into a certain direction. And in my opinion, that was a very important lesson to learn just about life in general, you know? I learn something new every time I go to Don's house. My friend's photographic practice is all about invention and experimenting with process. As far as my own process goes, each time I'm with Don, I look for new movie ideas. Here are two. Don and his wonderful Marcy have turned their South Philadelphia backyard into a garden of paradise and we will be making a film about Don's botanical photographs. And while Don is a modernist at heart, I am a classicist and love to tell stories. So if we can find Leif Skugforce, Don's old photo teacher, we're going to make a movie about this amazing documentary photographer.